thank the organizer for this wonderful opportunity to be at this exciting conference as well as my first visit to Kiev. So when I arrived in the hotel I noticed that uh, they were mispronouncing uh, my last name is Nikolik because the name came from Expedia or something like that. And then to, uh, since we are in Ukraine, to avoid uh, this mispronunciation, like my daughter even has CH but then it becomes Nikolic, so there's kind of problem to make it proper in uh, Latin alphabet, I actually wrote it in Ukrainian Cyrillic, so it's through Nikolic. In fact, what we really write in Serbian Cyrillic at this position is some letter which looks like H bar. So when you study quantum mechanics, you can use this letter which is say it's Ch. And moreover, if you're like using any Microsoft product, this is a suggestion. If you don't have LaTeX, you can easily get H bar by pulling out this letter from Serbian Cyrillic. So my home institution is um, in Delaware, which is the state in the middle between Washington DC and New York City with access to Atlantic Ocean. We actually have similar uh, colors in our flag, blue and uh, yellow or gold, as you have, with a little bit different tone, but of course we are not related to Ukraine, we are related to Sweden. So this was a Swedish colony when Sweden was a powerful country and tried to establish colony. If you have never been to Delaware, you might be actually hearing about it, because many people are interested all around the world about US elections, so this cross, which I just sketched, is an address in North Delaware, which contains 40,000 registered companies. So why would you register a company in Delaware? Well, if you call them right now, they would do it in 20 minutes for $100. And so you register a company, then you don't have to pay taxes as much as you do otherwise. So for example, Donald Trump has 400 companies registered in this address, and Hillary and Hillary Clinton, they have two. So they, like, as candidates, do not pay taxes, but we as ordinary citizens, of course, pay taxes and do not have this luxury. So, um, just to mention, everything that you see in red ink would be a reference or paper that is from my group and can be actually downloaded if you go through this wiki page, which I maintain for my quantum transport theory. So, the most important slide, let me give a credit from the outset to people who contributed to this. So, most of electromagnet stuff I'm going to talk about is uh, done in collaboration with my former student, Fazad Makfuzi. The resummation stuff was done in collaboration with these two senior colleagues. Some of the first few slides, and I had some kind of computational results, were done in collaboration with my former student and postdoc, and also these uh, senior collaborators here. So the title of the conference is Quantum Transport, so let me kind of try to give you quantum transport partial equilibrium in a nutshell. This means no Kubo formula, because Kubo formula is near equilibrium. So why do we do quantum transport? Well, the reason typically is that we have some kind of quasi-ballistic region, such as this guy here, and that small quasi-ballistic nanoscale region is attached to much bigger reservoirs which are injecting current into the system. So in that case you cannot use Kubo formula, sorry, you cannot use Boltzmann formula, diffusion equations used in all kinds of semiconductor companies. Instead, quantum transport pretty much means that if you want to find physical quantity, some kind of expectation value, you must run a trace of your operator times the non-equilibrium density matrix. So this is really quantum transport in a nutshell. So this guy here, the non-equilibrium density matrix, that's what you really have to construct, because these operators are usually easy objects to pull out with some commutators from standard textbook quantum mechanics. But the real quantum transport non-equilibrium quantum statistical mechanics is hidden in this guy, and one approach to quantum transport would be you simply take this non-equilibrium density matrix and try to solve Louisville, some type of Louisville equation, actually this is a master equation because eventually you have to trace out the reservoirs out of the game. And this approach really works when the coupling between the reservoir, this coupling here, and the nanoscale system is weak because you have to include this reservoir perturbatively. If the reservoirs are coupled to the nanoscale region strongly, then you pretty much have to use the so-called non-equilibrium green function formalism. If you really want to name people who contributed to developing this formula, so we should say Kerdish, Konstantinov, Perel, Schwinger, Cardinal Pine, so because there are too many names to spell them every time I mention, I'm just going to say NEGF, for non-equilibrium green function formalism. So in this formalism, which I'm going to use throughout this talk, both for single particle and many body discussions, we have to handle two green functions. The first one is like from some introductory many-body course, it's a retarded green function, the usual that you would find in equilibrium statistical, quantum statistical mechanics. But the one which is really non-equilibrium business is this one here, because the first one, retarded one, 
gives us energy levels of the system, density of states. The second one is needed to know how to populate those states. If you're in equilibrium, you populate them with fermier boser distribution function. If you're out of equilibrium, you have to find this GLS. In the absence of interactions, this whole formalism is identical to the Boutiquier that was briefly introduced yesterday in the talk of Carlo Benneke. But once you have many body effects, electron heating and other electrons or bosonic excitations, then you need to run the full non-equilibrium green function formalism and lambda boutique pretty much is not useful anymore. So one other thing that we learned over the past 15 years is also how to couple this formalism to realistic Hamiltonians. Hamiltonians describe realistic systems. For example, what I was using here as some kind of example is I have a graph in nanoribbon with topologically unprotected edge states or edge currents, that is the meaning of these two red arrows. I drill a nanopore inside this graph in nanoribbon, and then I shoot DNA into it. Why would I shoot DNA? Well, this could become one of the near future um, most interesting applications of graphene because if this device works, you could sequence human DNA within eight hours for less than thousand dollars, and then all kinds of diseases that are waiting for you in the future. So the reason why graphene is important here is because once the DNA is inside, there's only one nuclear base. All the other proposals of this type, they would have a kind of small cylinder made of some biological or solid state material. There are too many bases inside, and then you have to kind of error correct. So for this setup, you could say, well, let me try to write some simple Hamiltonian, such as sigma.p, seen uh, throughout this uh, conference over and over again. But this Hamiltonian, the proper boundary conditions to take into account that this is an anaribon, cannot describe this such currents correctly. You could switch to some kind of tight binding model, in which case you would have to put, for example, three orbitals, not just PZ, but PZ and 2D orbitals. And even if you do that and get a good description of this nanoribbon, there will be a problem how to describe DNA. So the real powerful way to describe the holistic systems is to take some kind of Hamiltonian coming from these first principles methods discussed by Yuri Mokroso um, in the previous session, and then couple that Hamiltonian to all this machinery of non equilibrium statistical mechanics to get current. Eventually, this system does see that as you put different nuclear bases into the nanopore, you do get different values of the current. This could be done in finite bias voltage, and that would allow you to differentiate whether you have one of these ACGT nuclear bases of uh, DNA sitting inside the nanopore. If you're doing this quickly enough, within eight hours you could scan all three billion base pairs of human DNA. So uh, a lot of uh, topics in the conference have been devoted to spintronics. So actually this quantum transport approach to spintronics, including holistic Hamiltonians, has actually done something important for real life. Often when we do calculations, they have a huge impact in terms of citations or impact factors of the journals. But sometimes these calculations do actually make impact on real life. So in 2001, this paper on uh, transporting iron, MGO iron, uh, tunnel junctions have been published, and they looked at the magnetoresistance, resistance, which is the difference in resistance between parallel and anti-parallel configuration of electrodes. So you take this difference between a parallel minus, sorry, anti-parallel minus parallel divided by anti uh, divided by anti-parallel, and if you take this ratio, which is the tunneling magnetoresistance, resistance, then you can find this ratio can be very large because you need to have as large as possible ratio of this type to actually detect very small magnetic domains on the spinning hard drive, which would allow you to put a lot of information. So the paper was published in 2009, to, sorry, 2001. In 2001, the largest magnetoresistance resistance that we could get was uh, from spin valves of uh, cobalt, copper, cobalt type, and that magnetoresistance resistance was like of the order of 20-30%. After the paper was published, experimentally started to try to make this junction. The theory says you should get this tunneling magnet resistance of the order of 5,000%. Experimentally, after about six years, they reached 500%. And by the time Furt and Grunberg got Nobel Prize for Spintronics Discovery of GMR, all of the uh, disk heads, which are reading the information from the spinning hard drives, have been converted to this kind of magnetic tunnel junctions because of this much larger magnetoresistance. resistance. So this was like one example of this quantum transport calculation of lander boutique type, coupled to realistic Hamiltonian, which had enormous impact on real life. There was an attempt in 2007 to recreate something as important as this. People noticed 
that graphene conducts current only in the corners of the Brillouin zone, which is where the Dirac columns are. This was discussed in many talks at the conference. On the other hand, nickel Fermi surface projected in the direction of transport has one spin species which conducts everywhere, and the other spin species does not conduct in these corners. Because the other spin species does not conduct in the corners, see there are no states in these points here, that means that graphene is going to block completely this other spin species, and that would make even larger magnetic resistance. So this is like intuitive idea. If you know, if you want to know how many layers of graphene you have to put into the game, you actually have to do the calculations. So you put five layers of graphene, three is actually the minimum, and you get perfect magnetic resistance, which in this optimistic, pessimistic kind of definition turns out to be 20,000%, even bigger than what we have in iron and iron. If you look at the finite bias voltage transport, it also has this negative differential resistance. You put voltage, current goes down. So like this is a device that many groups around the world have been trying to fabricate because it would be even better than iron and iron, but there are all kinds of materials issues you have to solve to eventually make it work. One of the things that would make it superior for the next topic I'm going to discuss, which is spin transfer torque, is that in iron and iron, as you increase the bias voltage, and for many applications, the bias voltage has to go all the way to 0.54 volts, the TMR drops down very quickly. And that kind of prevents you from reading the new state that you generate by passing this large current. On the other hand, in the case of this nickel graphene nickel or cobalt graphene nickel junctions, you still get a large magnetic resistance even at bias voltage of 0.4. So that will be one of the major reasons to switch from iron MGO iron, which is in all of the present computers using conventional spinning hard drives to this new technology of vertical graphene. The current, by the way, here flows vertically, not in the plane, but perpendicular to the plane of graphene. So one thing that we are trying right now to kind of finalize is a new type of spin transfer torque device where you would actually take cobalt graphene cobalt with three layers of graphene, send the current vertically through, as is shown by this battery, and get a torque which is almost the same as in spin valves, much bigger than in uh, this iron MGO iron junction, which is a standard device to start the spin transfer torque, but you generate torque with a much less heat dissipation. Because of all of this business of electronics, spintronics, the major thing is to reduce heat dissipation. If you want to run any kind of electronics in your present day computer, for example, you take your Pentium and you do so called overclocking, which people who play games like to do, and you want to send the frequency of your chip inside the computer to, um, let's say, 700 gigahertz, then your laptop at 700 gigahertz will have to be connected to the nuclear power plant in order to supply all the heat that is going to be wasted. And you know that it is not easy, especially here in Ukraine, nuclear power plants are dangerous. So this is one of the reasons why you need to um, reduce the heat dissipation. So like the spin transfer torque devices discussed in many talks since this weekend are still not widely accessible on the market precisely because of the fact that they are not still efficient in terms of uh, energy consumption to be like scaled to large size <coughs> memories. So, yes. Uh, the world record for overclocking is 8.1. Okay, 8.1, yes. So 700 is beyond the reach of any uh, overclock. So let me now go into theory. For example, how did I calculate this torque on the previous slide, which is a little bit different than Mosinova told you in his lecture. So first of all, in all of his lectures, everything was Kubo formula in response. The torque I'm calculating here has to be done at finite bias voltage, because only then you actually see magnetization switching. So you saw in several talks this major spintronics phenomenon. To have a torque, you have to have these non-collinear spins. So the spins are trying to come again. They cannot go to the second ferromagnet because they are not aligned in the same direction. Only the spin which is in the component of the second ferromagnet can go in. So that means that any component which is orthogonal to the second ferromagnet has to be absorbed. Absorbed torques, absorbed angular momentum means torque or magnetization. So eventually then in the lambda delicious Gilbert terminology, what you get is that this anti-dumping, this dumping which comes from magnet itself, Gilbert dumping, is compete with anti-dumping torque, and then you have field uh, which is causing precession competing with the so-called field -like torque. So like from a viewpoint of a theoretical physicist, torque is one of the most beautiful phenomena in non-equilibrium quantum statistical mechanics because of the fact that it 
requires to combine this description of fast moving quantum electrons with some kind of order parameter, which is a much slower moving object. You also have to, at the end of the day, connect this to some kind of application. So you're doing very fundamental physics while at the same time doing something for applications. Eventually, the slow degree of freedom is described by the kind of Newton's second law, which means all the operators have been replaced by the expectation value. But the connection to quantum mechanics of electrons is established by the fact that all parameters in the Landa Lewis Gilbert equation can be extracted from some quantum formalism, such as the green functions from my very first slide. So, in particular, as I told you at the very beginning, we have to do a trace of something non equilibrium times the operator. If you use the green functions, this is a textbook equation for equilibrium version of density matrix in terms of retired green function and Fermi distribution function. Out of equilibrium, it is this G lesser guy who gives you the new occupation of states. If you subtract these two guys, then you get a real non equilibrium density matrix because you don't want to have this guy in the game as some kind of equilibrium contribution. You take this real non-equilibrium matrix, you derive your spin torque operator by commuting Hamiltonian with the Pauli matrix, and that gives you now the torque. Once you take the trace using the definition I gave you in the very first slide, so the final formula is actually very nice and fundamental. If you want to calculate torque that this ferromagnetic layer is going to receive, what you have to do, you have to multiply your Zeeman exchange field, or in some kind of ab initio, they would call it exchange correlation field, with non-equilibrium magnetic moments. And then you have to sum them up over the whole volume of that ferromagnetic layer. This definition, by the way, has R, so you could actually do this integral even inside the atom. It would be intra-atomic non-collinearity, and you could do it, like for example, if you do it computationally on some grid of uh, lattice points based by less than an angstrom. So, uh, this is a kind of difficult slide, I'm only showing it because of the fact that uh, it's alternative to what Sinova showed you. So basically what I'm advertising here is this fluorescent PRB. If you take this non-equilibrium density matrix, which comes from G lesser, and you kind of manipulate it a little bit further, by taking G of ET and expanding it into the powers of delta M over delta T, and then keeping only first order, because as I said, the order parameter is very slow, so this number is going to be very small, you can actually in one stroke derive all the relevant quantity for spintronics and this kind of problem. So you can get charge current, which is a basic Lander formula, you can get spin torque, you can get charge pumping, and you can get Gilbert dumping. So all four quantities come from the so-called adiabatic expansion of GLS. So the formulas look massive, but this is kind of advertising for the power of this formalism. Then you can do additional splitting. This is something that does not really show up in the paper I just wrote it recently. And what you find out at the end of the day is that if you want to study torque beyond linear response, when you cannot apply the Kubo formula that Sinova showed in his two talks, you will end up with this kind of formulas governed by the scalar green functions. And the torques are going to be governed by these two expressions, which are defined only by the Fermi surface electrons. Or shallower on the Fermi surface, because they have this F minus FR. So these two formulas would allow you, this is a kind of my promise, to calculate torque in arbitrary system, in the presence of spin orbit coupling, whatever system you have, magnetic with the current flowing, non-collinear spins, these two guys are going to give you feel like an anti-dumping torque. So this is kind of something that you would have to use if you go beyond linear response, in which case the Kubo formula you saw in the two talks of Sinova and some other talks become inapplicable. So the problem with all of this stuff is that all the calculations that I showed in the previous four slides, as well as these formulas, assume elastic transport regime. So elastic transport regime means electron, electron is traveling through these nanostructures without losing its space and without losing its energy. The question is what happens when electron starts hitting other particles, such as phonons, magnets, other electrons, and so on. Especially for the case of phonons and electrons, there's going to be exchange of energy and then you get inelastic effects in your quantum transport. So this is pretty much a topic that has not been really discussed thus far. So in this setup here, I'm setting up a system, like a model system, which is again magnetic tunnel junction. I do have F insulating layer I, F, but in addition to electron, I'm also putting localized moments, and these localized moments can interact with electrons. The localized moments are kind of difficult object to handle the localized spins in many-body theory because they commute on different sides, 
the spin operators, but then don't commute on the same side. So in other words, they are neither bosons nor fermions. On the other hand, you don't want to stick with them because there is no so-called weak theory which allows you to do perturbative expansion if you stick with local moments. So eventually, everyone wants to map them to something else. So the typical mapping you saw in a couple of talks during this conference would be the so-called Holstein Primakov boson. This is or magnum. This is also what you see in textbook literature and statistical mechanics. But this is eventually not the best one because it leads to all kinds of strange terms of higher order ones expands and square roots and so on. It also leads to larger Hilbert space and unphysical states and so on. There's actually another transformation called Tyson Mahler bosons. There is another one called Schwinger bosons. That one is even worse than Holstein Primakov. There is something called Popo Fedotto semi fermions and finally Majorana fermions. So, depending on what kind of stuff you want to study, you have to decide what is the best way to map your spins to bosons and then be able to find out expansion of these many body interactions in terms of non interacting green functions. Eventually, in this calculation, I'm using 2 by 2 representation originally developed by Kerdish himself to now <coughs> figure out how this heating of electrons of these localized spins and eventually magnonic excitations is going to affect spin and charge currents. So, basically, in this formalism, all the equations look exactly the same, like it was a non interacting physics. The only difference now is that there is a new self energy coming from these many body interactions. And because you have to do this 2 by 2 representation of Kedis, you have to insert uh, smartly some kind of parallel 2 by 2 matrices into the business. So then you have to decide what kind of approximation you want to use for this object or this object. So, for example, for this object, we are using this and these diagrams. And then for this object, we are using the so called electron hole polarization bubble diagram. So these diagrams here, by the way, they look like you just have to solve three things at the same time, but they have these double wavy or double solid lines, which means that you have to reinsert the fully developed green function into these lines. So this is basically a summation of infinite class of diagrams to uh, get the physics as well as the conservation. So like sometimes in equilibrium physics, you could write just this diagram and keep it with single lines, which means you have just one single scattering. But in non-equilibrium phases, if you do that, you lose current conservation, which means the current in the left electrode is going to be different than the current in the right electrode. So non-equilibrium phase is much more difficult than equilibrium physics, which is why this typically has to be done on the computer, because you always have to sum up many classes of diagrams to keep current conserved. And actually, the convergence is defined by I L minus R, I R being less than 10 to the minus something. So um, this is the first issue of doing this. First non-trivial result is finite bias voltage applied to this magnetic tunnel junction. We see that as long as the bias voltage is very small, this will be linear response regime, the sum of all spin currents for either parallel or anti-parallel orientation of magnetizations is just zero, which is a current conservation here goes law. However, as you increase the bias voltage, this sum becomes non-zero. So what is going on? The spin current of electrons is becoming non conserved and it's being transferred into magnets. So, if I sum up the spin current of electrons and magnets, I would get, of course, zero. But since I'm considering only electrons, this shows that it's finite bias voltage. I'm really heating electrons onto magnets, and the effect becomes important after this small bias voltage of about like uh, 0 0.05 volts or so. So, uh, some other things that are interesting in this uh, specific example is that what we're really trying to do, we are trying to describe experiments. So in experiments, if you plot second derivative of current over voltage, which is the so-called inelastic spectroscopy, you do see two peaks very close to zero bias, and then you see two extra peaks away from zero bias. So these two peaks very close to zero bias are the so-called zero bias anomaly, and they actually signify inelastic scattering of electrons with magnets. The ones further away signify inelastic scattering of electrons with phonons, which is why you have to handle both of them at the same time. So, uh, if you take a look at the density of states, which you can get just by taking imaginary part of that retarded green function, and here, by the way, I count the density of states in the presence of current, so this is non-equilibrium density of states, I do see that electronic, electronic density of states it, it's almost unaffected, non-interacting, interacting, with turning on and off 
the many body interaction with magnets. So whether I turn it on or off, the density state remains almost the same. But in the case of magnets, which have a much smaller bandwidth of about 1.0 electron volts, and then they feel this interaction much stronger, as soon as you turn on the interaction with the electron, this original density of states, which was kind of featureless, acquires these features. There are these sharp peaks and broadening, hitting all the way to zero energy. So this broadening in physical sense means that magnum now becomes surrounded by electron hole virtual pairs and as a composite object, some kind of inverse magnonic polaron moves through the system. So this is a kind of many body effect which completely normalizes magnum spectrum that you would never be able to pick up if you use simplistic theories. So one of the reasons why people started looking at these electromagnetic interactions, the first paper on this topic, one of the first ones was written actually by third Nobel Prize winners and Levy, is that eventually electron exciting magnets would have to affect torque, because torque is magnetization dynamics. If there is a single spin, micro spin magnetization dynamics, then we talk about just uh, simplistic type of switching, but once you have this large bias voltages of 0.4 volts, once you excite magnets, you're going to get much more complicated switching patterns, and eventually magnets should contribute to torque, but they should also reduce the magnetic resistance. So this kind of experimentally uh, observed effect should be described also theoretically. In the paper by Furt and Levy, they basically try to do some kind of let's twist the lander boutique formula to its limits and include this inelastic scattering, but eventually there is no way to include this kind of many body effects rigorously, we need the scattering approach of Lander Boutique here. Instead, you have to shift to this many body diagrams and all this stuff. The hurdle, however, is that because of the fact that magnons feel like a strongly correlated subsystem in this business, because the bandwidth is very small, what is important is the ratio of interaction strength. So, what really controls this many body systems is ratio between interaction strength and this bandwidth W here. Because that number is very large, you actually need kind of more diagrams to really capture all this stuff. So by the way, if I actually run my calculations that I described in the previous slide and try to see what will happen for this experimental problem, I do see that the elastic part of current, the one which looks exactly the same as Lander Boutique here, does not have pretty much any special features, but the inelastic part of the current does generate exactly the two peaks that you see in the experimental measurements. So this is an example that is quite complicated and quite demanding to calculate machinery is able to kind of describe, even using the simple 2D model, what is happening in this experiment. So as I said, the next step would be, let us try to include more diagrams, go to some higher order, and capture better this non perturbative effects of formation of these quasi-bound states when magnum gets surrounded by electron hole pairs. It turns out that this is not easy because in all of the physics nobody can calculate diagrams to very high order. So for example, if you go to QCD, or you go to some QED, quantum field theories, at most, they can maybe do these diagrams to so-called six loops, which means six order of perturbation theory and so on. So, moreover, there are recent studies in this uh, strongly correlated community pointing out that this procedure that I do here, which is basically I try to reinsert the full many-body green function into this single type of diagram and then iterate over and over until it reaches self-consistency, might be very dangerous because all of these diagrams that I'm picking here, here using physical intuition are based on the existence of the so-called large reward functional, which is telling me that I have this conservation of current if I sum all these diagrams to infinite order in the previous slide. So these guys are saying, look, maybe the GW or this self-consistent Born approximation from a previous slide ought to be trashed into the trash bin because of the fact that when the interaction becomes too strong, you can get multiple unphysical solutions as you try to sum up these diagrams. So that's why this PRL has this fancy title, Non-Existence of Latin General Functional. The other paper actually has a title on the dangers of partial diagrammatic summation. So like there's very dangerous stuff waiting for you. If you try to run, you pick up some diagrams based on your physical intuition or based on these conservation laws, and you try to read it only then. The proper way to handle these many body problems would be to edit every single diagram at order one, every single diagram at order two, and so on. But then the question is, which can be done, by the way, at least numerically, if you use the so-called diagrammatic Monte Carlo developed by Prokofiev and other people in equilibrium and now being transported in my equilibrium. But then the question becomes like to have what kind of order of perturbation theory you can go, as well as 
once you reach some order, let's say seven and eight, which they can do in this uh, methodology, how can you conclude what will happen at higher orders that you cannot evaluate explicitly? So this now goes back into some kind of pedagogical discussion of what does it mean to do the grammatic series in any kind of quantum theory. So in 1952, Dyson published a very influential paper saying that something is badly wrong with quantum electrodynamics. So what is wrong? Well, he said, let us imagine that somebody inverts the sign of charge. The charge becomes complex number. It doesn't make sense, of course, in the physical world, but if you're studying anything in physics, you should actually study it in a complex plane. So the real value of this is that Dyson is saying, please take a look at both um, positive and negative values of E squared. And of course, E squared or E squared over uh, HC, which is a fine structure constant, is the perturbation expansion parameter in this case. And then he, simply with physical intuition, figures out that in that world, with E squared being negative, there would be a continuous production of electron hole pairs and the whole vacuum become unstable. So in other words, the world is not stable when you invert the sign of charge. That means that the radius of convergence of QED perturbation theory has to be zero. Because if it is zero on this side, because of this instability when E squared is less than zero, it has to be zero on the right hand side. So that means this whole circle of convergence shrinks to zero. So what is the meaning of a perturbation series in quantum field theory or quantum mechanics with zero radius? It turns out that the meaning of that is that you can still extract some physical results as long as the coupling constant is very small, such as the fine structure constant, and you keep the number of orders of perturbation theory at a low level. So like the number of orders of perturbation theory in QED that you have to keep to get a reasonable result was estimated by Dyson himself to be 137, and today nobody on the planet Earth today, or for the next 10,000 years, would ever be able to reach 137 orders of perturbation theory, which will correspond to 137 loops. There was actually a better estimate for fermions by Migdal and Krajinov. They said it's 5,000, so QED is safe. Nevertheless, this problem has been resurrected in graphene, because graphene, as we saw in one of the talks at this conference, is QED in two dimensions. In the case of graphene, the fine structure constant from vacuum is mapped to this new constant beta, which turns out to be 2.5 divided by the, the electric permittivity. If you pick up surrounding material with electric permittivity of 5, the fine structure constant of graphene becomes 0.5. And then the perturbative expansion breaks down at order 3. By the way, this is a very strange paper. Victor is here. So this is a peer review which contains 70 pages. I don't know how you allow this to be published. And when you open the 70 pages, what they did, they just dumped mathematical notebooks one by one into the 70 pages. So like, this is really unacceptable to publish something that is unreadable, because it's readable by machine, but not by the human being. So in any case, after dumping 70 pages of Mathematica, they were able to figure out that something is wrong with this perturbative expansion. So if this looks abstract and kind of not related to condensed matter physics. Let me actually warn you how many people are teaching quantum mechanics here as professors. Just one. That's not okay, two, three, four. So like you have to be careful that this problem arises just in elementary quantum mechanics. In other words, if you don't know about it and you assign a homework problem like this, a student might sue you, let's say in the US, because you gave them a wrong problem and they fail the class. So let's suppose you take a harmonic oscillator, a textbook quantum mechanics and you add quartic perturbation on top of it. When you add quart quartic perturbation theory, you're going to get some new energy levels, a little bit different potential, and everything looks good, as long as G is greater than zero. But when you invert the sign of this perturbation, G less than zero, which is exactly like Dyson argument, then the potential is going to bend down, and the electron is going to have probability to tunnel through. Tunneling through means that you now have a terms of the type e to the minus 1 over x, the so-called instant of the quantum field theory, which cannot be seen by perturbative expansion. So if you give students this homework problem, everything looks good, as long as the order of perturbation theory is small. But if they can reach higher order, they're going to see that coefficient 75 of quartic harmonic oscillator is 10 to the 144. There is factorial scaling even in regular quantum mechanics. A problem which is actually much more relevant for the study materials is Stark effect. Many people are studying Stark effect of excitons in, let's say, transition metal decalconites. So you go back to elementary quantum mechanics, you take hydrogen atom, you see these discrete energy levels, you add electric field to it, and suddenly electron has a probability to turn out the so-called auto ionization from the hydrogen atom. 
What really happens here is that the original spectrum, which was discrete for the hydrogen electron inside the hydrogen atom, mathematically speaking, becomes continuous. So now you have a choice. Either you're going to the as Hamiltonian, whose whole spectrum is continuous, which is something we rarely do in regular physics, maybe you could do it if you're a mathematical physicist, or you're going to try to do perturbation theory, in which case you're going to try to connect these original discrete levels to the new resonances, because eventually this new continuous spectrum in plot density of states does have resonances. So in other words, the goal of perturbation theory is to find the centroids of these resonances, as well as their widths. A centroid of resonance would be this guy delta, the width of the resonance would be this guy gamma, which is a complex number. So if you actually evaluate perturbation theory for hydrogen atom from type of quantum mechanics, usually type of quantum mechanics they will stop here. But if you continue and you go to order 4, which is 8 because the electric field comes with a square, you would find out that all these higher numbers are rubbish. So the goal of this resummation theory is to take these rubbish numbers, which look nonsensical, shuffle them around, and extract from them this delta, which is the real number of our energy levels, as well as gamma. So if you think that maybe this, we could get this delta by shuffling these large numbers, it is very puzzling how to get gamma, because gamma is a complex number. So how can I take these large real numbers, shuffle them around, and get a complex number? So like maybe that is, that is not possible at all. So here is now a hands-on part of the talk. If you have a laptop with Mathematica installed, you could even join the talk by punching in this stuff into your computer. So here I'm actually giving you a summary of all of the stuff that we did in the past three slides and the simplest possible example, which is always advantages when you do teaching. So I'm saying let us try to evaluate the integral of exponent of minus x squared minus g times x4, which would be like a partition function in statistical mechanics of harmonic oscillator, or let's say if you want fancy language, phi 4 theory in 1 plus 0 dimensions. So you want to evaluate this integral from minus infinity to infinity, you punch this in Mathematica, and Mathematica says here is the answer, Bessel k function. So this is exact non-perturbative result. However, as a physicist, you don't know what is exact non-perturbative result, and you could say, let me evaluate this guy exactly, and let me expand this guy in the power series. So when you do the expansion, at some point you're going to penetrate sum into the integral, you're going to get your result, and then if the coupling constant is small, which will be the small alpha of quantum electrodynamics, you could actually evaluate all the way to five significant digits that both perturbative result and this exact non-perturbative give you the same value, which means that even though this looks kind of strange and um, divergent, you can extract results if you keep the number of terms small. So this is this stuff here. This was this optimal truncation of Dyson 137, middle of kind of 5000, and so on. Nevertheless, if you ask yourself, can I add more terms to make this uh, more accurate? As you add more terms, you get this. So this is the meaning of zero radius of convergence. There is no way to improve the result by adding more terms of perturbative expansion. Eventually, the reason for this is that as a physicist, we make something which is mathematically not allowed, which is we can change the order of sum and integration. So at that point, we're actually introducing this divergence. But since we know that this non-perturbative result exists, the goal of resummation theory is to take these rubbish numbers and somehow, somehow recover this exact non-perturbative result. And that's exactly what we have to, what we are doing with this resummation theory. The standard resummation theory actually requires to do something called Borel resummation, which means you divide by n factorial, then you try to do this integration, Laplace transforms, and so on. Typically, this is done by using the so-called Padea approximants, which means you, once you get your physical perturbation theory, since this is still a power series, you kind of shift to Padea to get analytical continuation of it, and you combine it with this Borel resummation. So eventually, if you apply this to Stark problem, you could actually get a very nice match between real and imaginary parts of those energies of um, Stark problem, but the price you have to pay is 72 orders of perturbation theory. And this becomes impractical because once you go to many body physics, nobody can evaluate diagrams to 72 loops. So what we did in this setup, we found out a new method to resum, which somehow evokes Gauss hypergeometric functions. It is discussed in this PRL here. It basically requires to have a function in the branch cut, somehow use only fourth order perturbation theory, that's the beauty of it, 
fourth order solves everything. And with fourth order perturbation theory, we are able to remap everything to the Schipper geometric functions and find out physical information. So once we find the energies of the Stark problem, we get exact match of the imaginary part and we get exact match up to very high electric field of the real part. So this was an example of how you take this rubbish numbers of million size and get both imaginary part and real part of your energy levels. So the final stroke to see if this can actually work in something which is not single particle quantum mechanics, something many body non-trivial. So here what I'm doing, I take exactly that diagram I had on the uh, four slides ago. So this diagram here, evaluated one by one, is actually this infinite sum. So that's what I was doing three slides ago. So it has many of these individual diagrams which you actually want to sum up to infinite order to get current conservation. Now I'm saying, let me actually stop at the fourth order, consider only the 17 diagrams, evaluate them one by one, and see if I can include what will happen if I am at the infinite order without actually summing everything to infinite order. So what I eventually do, the goal here is to find out how much the current is going to be reduced by electron heating phonon sitting in this nano junction, could be also magnum, same thing applies. So, um, if I run the scheme that I showed you for this um, stark problem of hydrogen atom, I do get that any attempt to evaluate just first order diagrams, see the first order would be this guy here, second order diagrams which you are going to evaluate these two guys, so any attempt to keep this perturbative series just order one, order two, order three, immediately leads to divergence. See how, as the, as the function of the coupling strength between electrons and bosons, this diagrammatic, the current that you're trying to calculate just flies away from the correct result. Nevertheless, once we resum these 17 diagrams by mapping them to the hypergeometric function, so that means we take a power expansion for the current, and we equate that power expansion with the expansion for the hypergeometric function, and essentially position the branch cut of the hypergeometric function to the branch cut of this power series, we actually get with just this fourth order 17 diagrams the same result as if there's some infinitely many of them. And the advantage of this approach is that as you increase the voltage or you increase the coupling strength, this approach of trying to read something infinite order numerically becomes very complicated because you have to do many iteration. With this approach, you do just one single shot calculation, you evaluate 17 diagrams, and then by magic, you get the result as if you evaluate it all infinitely many. So eventually, the reason why this works, and at the moment everybody who is doing this or trying to do mostly high energy physics, not so much in low energy physics like the condensed matter physics we are doing, is essentially looking at the structure of these problems in the complex plane. The reason why this one works is because somehow a hypergeometric function is able to match the structure of this power series of current in the as a function of electron boson, electron phonon interaction strength in the complex plane, and once these things match each other, then the hypergeometric function contains the secret of the whole series, even though I'm evaluating only the first four orders of Feynman diagrammatic expansion. Okay, so this is my conclusion, which is basically like a bunch of problems for the future. What does it take to push all of these many body calculations or calculations somebody was asking in the previous talk? What does it mean to calculate DFT with, let's say, 10,000 atoms? So like this are actually the problems for the future to make all of these calculations beyond just these models that we're using now, which are pretty much just for testing the formalism before we know how to apply it to something as realistic, as were the examples from the beginning of the talk, which are all non-interactive. So like everything non-interactive can be done, it's only like the problem of how big is your computer. Anything interacting is very difficult to do because of the enormous computational complexity. Which All model? your models are linear models. What do you mean by linear? I mean, you're short of the equation that you show completely no any nonlinear mm -hmm. effects. So as soon as we have any nonlinearities, I guess this theory will break. Uh, which theory breaks and which... Yeah, I mean this matching, even this hypergeometric series. If you have nonlinear effects in your short of the equations, how would you use but, in principle yeah, but the equation theory? Yeah, but what do you mean nonlinear? Uh, nonlinear shading equation is something that this bunch of Italian people developed to uh, uh, describe the collapse of a wave function. Many other people developed. Yeah, probably, but 
Yeah. So, 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 so non -linear, question, non -linear shading question is not, uh, just a second, it's not the mainstream question, physics. It's not the mainstream physics. Answer my question. The, the question, non-linear effects I ignore. Uh, so, uh, I can answer the question if you give me some specific example what you mean by non-linear. Shading equation linear, the serious reasons why it has to be linear. In this many body phase, we could have no linearity such as unharmonicities. But we can handle them better, but we will simply be writing more terms in Hamiltonian. So that's the only thing we have to do. So like no linear shading equation, yes, that would be some kind of quantum optics, gross Pitevsky, but this was all textbook quantum mechanics that I was running. Thank you.